in 1979, an amazing rock group, an Australian rock group by the name of ACDC belted out an amazing single. Uh, it was called The Highway to Hell. I was into this heavy metal rock stuff and I love this group. And to be honest with you, I said, whoa, I used to sing that song along with them. And they sang proud and loud. I'm on the highway to hell. And the whole crowd, which was along with them, joined with them and sang, I'm on the highway to hell. And I love that song. And the album and that particular song was simply amazing. Well, after I got to know the Lord, things were different. And I reckoned that my favorite band at that point of time, ACDC, believed that they were going to hell. But interestingly, many Christians still do not believe that there's a hell. Very ironic. So the question, what is hell? What happens in hell? Wikipedia gave us this information. In religion and folklore, hell is an afterlife location in which evil souls are subject to punitive suffering, often torture as eternal punishment after death. Very interesting that Wikipedia kind of has got it right. Again, it's interesting to note that there are more people who believe in heaven but disregard hell. So today I'm here on a journey to embark as to what hell is all about. And uh, thankfully, God has given us enough information in the only source of practical wisdom, I believe, the Bible. And it shows us the mysteries of hell. So join me as we embark this amazing journey of finding out what hell really is. I'm not going to get into Hebrew and Greek and all that. I'm going to lay all that aside. Cut right into the meat of the subject to see if what ACDC said is true when they sang with all their heart and mind and strength, I am on the highway to hell. Did you figure out what you just heard? Did that make any sense? Well, all I did was play a small segment of that song uh, backwards. And uh, this is a phenomenon called backward masking or back masking in short. And so ACDC was uh, accused of back masking messages into songs. And we're not getting into that now. The guitarist Agnes Young, uh, he said something like this. He said, you didn't need to play the album backwards because we never hid the messages. We called an album Highway to Hell. There it was in front of them. So in other words, what he was saying is, I'm not going to waste my time in backmasking. The message is very direct. We are on the highway to hell. Well, ironically, as I mentioned to you, ACDC seems to believe that they're heading to hell. At least they believe that there's a hell. But uh, many Christians uh, sometimes don't even believe that there's a hell. And therefore, let's take a good look at the scriptures to see what Jesus himself said. Jesus spent more time warning people about the dangers of hell than he did comforting people of the hope of heaven. And trust me, I enjoyed that song so very much. But at one point of time, when I began to uh, learn the scriptures and the Lord ministered to me in so many different ways, I began to take a good look at the subject of hell. All that we are doing is looking at what Jesus said. I'm going to spend some time in the scriptures. Let the scriptures speak for itself. Questions like, how can a loving God send me to hell? The word hell is translated many different ways. Again, also depending on the translation that you have. Some will call it the grave and the pit and whatever not. But let me say this to you. Generally, the Bible uses the word hell. 
if you will permit me to just take a good look at this word, you will find different words mentioned for the word hell. Let me just begin by the first word, which is called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, Sheol, uh, which again uh, uh, is also referred to as the pit uh, in the Bible. So Sheol, the pit, Job chapter 17 and verse 16 is the reference. Will they go down to the gates of Sheol? My King James Bible straight away uses the word Sheol. In Numbers chapter 16 and verse number 33, uh, I'm sure you're aware of how the earth opened up and swallowed these murmuring Israelites. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The word pit is again the word Sheol. The next word you would find in the Bible uh, is the word Hades, Hades. And Hades is most likely translated as grave, or in other words, it simply means the abode of the dead. What happens to somebody after he dies? Uh, they don't just disappear, okay? They are held in a so-called waiting room, and therefore it is called the abode of the dead. And uh, the reference is again, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verse number 23. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. Jesus referred it as Hades. But if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, O death, where is your sting? Asked the Apostle Paul. O Hades, where is your victory? And so another word the Bible uses very sparingly is the word Tartarus. And it's the references found in the book of 2 Peter, chapter number 2 and verse number 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. But I just want you to notice the word hell there is the word Tartarus. And in the Gospel of Matthew 5, verse 29, Jesus said, if you're right, I causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is more profitable that you, more profitable that your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. That word hell is literally translated Gehenna. What is this Gehenna? Uh, the, the Strong's gives us a meaning. This was originally the valley of Hinnom, south of Jerusalem where the filth and the dead animals of the city were cast out and burned. A fit symbol of the wicked and their future destruction. And so some have even concluded that when Jesus spoke about hell, it was referring to a geographical place at that point of time and hell no more exists because that was a physical place where the dump of the city was actually thrown and it was burnt in fire. But uh, we need to do some cross-referencing to get the matters right. We need to have the whole counsel of God in this matter. Again, there is another reference to hell in the Bible, but this time it is called the lake of fire. Though there is a difference between hell and the lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 10. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and there will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Notice the words, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. So basically we can divide lake of fire from the rest of it, the rest of hell so as to speak, because hell is going to be finally dumped into the lake of fire. And that's going to be the final close and Satan will be bound. The verse I just read, Revelation 20.10, makes a clear indication of that. Now, having given you some information, the question we need to ask ourselves is, why would a God send us to hell? And this is one important question. I recall as a small boy watching a movie called Hell uh, in this projector they brought to Sunday school and they played it on the, displayed it on the wall. And though the production was very, very poor, uh, though the acting was not very up to the mark uh, as it is today. Uh, I remember just some flames like that and some people screaming and things like that. But that was enough to shake the daylights out of me. 
And now, praise God, I can tell you and give you some more information as to what hell is all about. Why would a loving God send us to hell? And that's a very important question. Why would a loving God, he is a God of love. As a matter of fact, God so loved the world. And why would he send people to hell? And first of all, let me answer the question by saying, God does not send anyone to hell. A person, when he refuses this greatest gift of salvation, is by default telling the Lord, Lord, I, I, I do not need you. And because of the refusal to accept this greatest gift of salvation, does anybody go to hell? And, and that's a fact. When you say God is a God of love, every time you see God being a perfect God of love, he also must be a perfect God of justice. The Bible says the soul that sins must die. And if God were to cover his eyes and let sin pass by, he instantly ceases to be a just God. If you look at the Bible, beginning from the book of Genesis itself, God always punished evil. Not that he's not loving, he's just. The wicked world was destroyed in the flood of Noah. We know that. And there are so many reasons to that. But let me just tell you, God cannot tolerate sin. And there is a punishment for anybody who transgresses the law. Adam and Eve, the Lord told Adam very implicitly, the day you eat of the fruit of the tree, you will surely die. God loved man. It is true. God loved his creation, but man had to pay the price. And thank God for the second Adam, Jesus Christ, who came on, took on flesh, took on blood, who was born through the inception of the Holy Spirit. And he borrowed the womb of Mother Mary, born into this world, just like any human being, yet without sin, because there was no male intervention. He was born for that one purpose, to carry the sins of many, to become the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. He took up that cross, died on the cross of Calvary, the eternal pending doom of mankind, heading to hell because of Adam's disobedience, was annihilated by the Lord Jesus Christ because he paid with his own precious blood. And therefore, it's a gift. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 Verse 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he or she is a new creation. In Christ, what is it to be in Christ? To say, Lord, I have sinned. I want to accept your free gift. I know I cannot pay it on my own. I need you. And when you make that prayer and confess Jesus as the Lord of your life, you are saved. But a person who refuses this free gift, this free offer, is heading to a place called hell not because Jesus wants you to go there. It's because that individual did not appropriate this free gift. And therefore, by default, there are only two places to go. As a matter of fact, let me say this. All of us will live forever. We are eternal beings. Yes, this body may go back to the dust, but we are eternal beings. But the question is, where are you going to spend your eternity? In heaven with the loving Lord Jesus Christ, where there is Jesus, that is heaven. Are are you going to a place where Jesus and his presence is not there? And that place is called hell. And now as I'm speaking to you, there is a literal place called hell. And so who goes to hell? A person who refuses this free gift of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. So make sure that you call on the name of the Lord. The book of Romans chapter 10 makes it very clear. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. My friend, you and I had no option of choosing the place where we were born. But praise God, you and I have control over where we are going. I pray you will head to the place where Jesus is, where there is love and there is glory and there is ecstasy and joy unspeakable that's a place called heaven the next question would be this then why was hell created hell was created in matthew's gospel chapter 25 and verse number 41 the bible makes it very clear then he will also say to those on the left hand depart from me you cursed 
into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels it was not prepared for man it was prepared for the devil and his angels who was the devil the devil is lucifer a created cherub created by god himself isaiah chapter 14 and ezekiel chapter 28 gives us that uh, description that he was the created cherub a worship leader fitted in with all kinds of orchestral instruments in the presence of god but he rebelled against god and he was cast down and he's the one who's actually causing all the havoc that we see in this world when he's going to be bound in that bottomless pit called the lake of fire his time is up and that's why he's trying to do all that he can do to destroy people let me read this verse again the bible says into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels so why was hell created for the rebelling angels and the devil himself and it is not meant for you and for me but if somebody rejects the free offer of jesus christ there's no other place to go it is by default a place called hell do not go there as a cross reference let me go to the book of revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 15 and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire very important words there is a book called the book of life the day you accept jesus as the lord of your life your name is inscribed on that book but the bible says if your name is not in that book my god they are heading straight to the lake of fire which is forever and ever and remember this it was not meant for you it was not meant for any human being it was meant for the devil and his cohorts but just in case somebody refuses the free gift of salvation they go to this place called hell and hell will ultimately be thrown into the lake of fire the words hell we mentioned a little while ago let's talk about it as a holding place somebody when they die they are in this holding place yes there's a suffering yes there's a comfort but ultimately it is just a holding place but there will be a day when hell itself is going to be thrown into the lake of fire based on the verses i just read permit me to read revelation chapter number 20 and verse number 10 the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever i'm going to read verse 12 and i saw the dead small and great standing before god and the books were opened and other was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written and in the books the sea gave up the dead who were in it death and hades delivered up the dead who were in them I remember telling you about uh, death and hades being like a like a waiting room and they were judged each one according to their works verse 14 then death and hades were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire jesus spoke more than any other person about hell you know why because he is the lord of heaven earth and hell i believe the love of christ is much stronger than the fear of hell i'm not preaching this message to sort of put fear inside you why because the love of christ is much stronger than the fear of hell there was one particular time i preached in a particular church and i finished off and i gave them an altar call i said shun hell and and embrace heaven and later the pastor came to me and said to me uh, sandeep you should be scaring people like that i want to tell you this much today you see even if i use the method of scaring you and you made it to heaven it is worth it did you hear what i said it is okay to use any method the love of christ is good to draw you 
And when I say I'm going to scare the hell out of you, if fear is going to be the motivation, it's still okay. The Apostle Paul says, the love of Christ constrains me. As a matter of fact, he said in the book of Romans chapter 8, height, depth, principalities, powers. He says, nothing will be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You see, the love of God compels us to follow him. It's not the fear of hell, really not. But I'm telling you this much. It is my duty as a preacher to also keep you aware, just like a news broadcaster would say, tomorrow you're going to have a thunderstorm. I'm not bringing in bad news. I'm only just merely telling you the reality of this place. And that is all. And remember this, Jesus is Lord. As a matter of fact, Colossians 1.16 says, By him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, Visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him who created hell. The Lord Jesus Christ, he is the master of even hell because he's the one who's going to throw Satan into that lake of fire. He is Lord. Praise the Lord. John chapter 1 and verse number 3 says, All things... John chapter 1 verse 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Right now, it's the time of the grace of God. The Bible says, Revelation 3.20, He stands at the door and knocks. If you open the door, he will come in. This is the time of mercy and grace. But I can tell you the day will come. The Bible says the church of Christ will be raptured. It will be caught up with, together with Jesus in the clouds. And the world is going to go into a chaotic time of tribulation, of which three and a half years will be the tribulation. And the next three and a half years will be what is called the great tribulation. That's when the devil is going to have his way and the world is going to go to utter chaos. Death will do its job and destroying people. But I'm telling you to escape all these things. Jesus Christ is the only way. He's the bridge to heaven. Make Jesus Christ your Lord. And finally, the Bible says, there is going to be a battle between good and evil. And you know the story. The book of Revelations makes it very clear. Jesus will destroy the evil one with the word of his mouth and totally destroy the devil. And they will be cast into the lake of fire. Hold on. This is not the end, but the end is coming. We are victorious. We are on the victor's side. Hallelujah. And that's why I encourage myself that whatever you do on this earth, please ensure your spot in heaven where Jesus is. Escape this tribulation period which is going to be unleashed on this earth when the church of Jesus Christ will be raptured up. Some people will even think that what I'm saying is a fairy tale. But let me tell you this. The day when the church is raptured, the Bible will become the bestseller. Because the answers to what happens after that is found only in the Bible. That is why the recording I do is going to be very, very important in the days of the tribulation. Therefore, messages like what I'm sharing right now will be sought after in that period of time. This is a very important message. Jesus Christ is coming soon. And the Bible says after the rapture, we will come along with Jesus to establish the millennial reign on this earth where there's going to be peace and joy. And I'm telling you, it's going to be the perfect government. After a thousand years, Satan will be released for a short duration. And then the Bible says the final close of events, Satan will be bound into the lake of fire. I'm telling you, this sounds like a fiction movie, but it is all in your Bible. Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared to meet Jesus? Well, let me go on. Let me go on. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ is Lord. He created the heaven and the earth. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, Jesus said, I am he who lives. I was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. No more death. In Christ, we are alive forevermore. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Jesus said, I have the keys 
of Hades and of death. I want to let you know, Jesus is on the throne. He is ruling. He's got the keys, not the devil. Luke chapter 16, verse 19, an amazing portion of scripture, which relates the fact about hell and what happens there. And by the way, have you ever thought, where is the location of hell? Where is hell located? Uh, somebody says it's in some black hole in some galaxy. I mean, uh, we don't know, but the Bible gives, uh, gives us a little bit of, of insight. In the book of Matthew's gospel, chapter 12 and verse 40, Jesus said, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So when Jesus died, he faced Satan and settled the scores with him. So most likely hell could be in the center of the earth. Well, if you don't believe that, it's okay. As long as you believe that there's a heaven and there's a hell. Again, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 9. Jesus said these words. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? Question mark. He descended into the lower parts of the earth. So hell could probably be in the belly of this earth. In the center portion of this earth. He came up with this uh, article which talks about the core of the earth, the temperatures which could be even as hot as the surface of the sun. So probably right in the center of the earth. Well, that's just some information. You don't have to believe it if you don't want to believe it. But coming back to book of Luke chapter 16, verse 19, a story of a rich man uh, who had a great time on this earth. The Bible says he, he clothed in purple, wore the best clothes, uh, designer clothes, ate the best meals, and the Bible says, and fared sumptuously every day, enjoyed himself. But the problem with this rich man was that he did not know the Lord. No indication about him having any connection to do with the Lord. How do I know that? Because ultimately the Bible says he landed in hell. You know the story. Again, we are introduced to another character in the same portion in verse 20 about a person by the name of Lazarus. Lazarus, in contrast, was a beggar. And not only was a, he was a beggar, but he had uh, physical ailments. He had sores on his feet and the dogs came and licked his sores, a terrible place to be. And both of them were separated by a gate. Remember that. Verse number 22 is a very interesting verse because let me tell you this. The common denominator for any human being is the gateway of death, rich, poor, death will knock at somebody's door. Whether you are young or old, death will knock at somebody's door. It doesn't matter of what strata in life we come from, death will one day knock at your door. So death, my friend, is a common denominator. Verse 22 says, the beggar died and he was carried by the angels. Believe in angels. There's an angel to assigned to carry us into the place of comfort. In this case, it is called Abraham's bosom which is a temporary holding place of comfort. All right. But the rich man, the Bible says the rich man died and he was buried. No angel out there. And in verse 23, and being in torments doesn't talk about a space. Instantly, he realized that he was in torments in Hades. Remember one of the words I mentioned about hell is the word Hades. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Couple of interesting things that we can take from this portion of scripture. Number one, his body was buried on the earth. But when he woke up, he realized and he felt pain. In other words, there is a spiritual body that we will assume after death. Yes, indeed, this body will go to the dust. This physical body goes back to the dust. But look at this man, he being in torments in Hades. That means number one, he felt pain. Number two, he lifted up his eyes. He had eyes. Further on, he even says, Father Abraham. That means he knew who Father Abraham was without need of any introduction. His faculties were alive and well. He was able to recognize Abraham. And not only that, he said, 
have Lazarus dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue. So in other words, he had a tongue. He was thirsty. He felt pain. And the Bible says he was in torments. Interesting. Though the physical body is on this earth, his faculties was alive. Hell is a place of torments. In the book of Matthew's gospel, chapter 8, verse 12, it talks about it's a place of everlasting weeping. Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verse 42, it's a place of wailing. Matthew's gospel, chapter 13, verse 50, it's a place of gnashing of teeth in excruciating agony and pain. Matthew's gospel, chapter 25, verse 30, it's a place of darkness. Luke chapter 16, verse 24, place of flames. Isaiah chapter 33, verse 14, place of burning. Luke chapter 16, verse 23, a place of torments. Matthew's gospel, chapter 25, verse 41, it says, and then he will also say, depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire. It is everlasting. This is a terrible place to be. I did a survey some time ago, and uh, if I'm right on this, I believe eight people die per minute. And as I'm preaching this message, people are dying as we speak. Now I pray, how many of them know Jesus Christ, the only way to reach heaven? This is my burden, that each one of you will be able to evangelize, speak about Jesus to somebody. Because as we speak, people are heading to this place. And even as I told you, the favorite band I, I used to listen to and no more, uh, they sang the song, Highway to Hell. They sang it with all emotion and pathos and belief. Verse 25, for those of us who think it's a figurative place, no, no, no. This seems to be more than a figurative place uh, in my reading and understanding. Verse 25, but Abraham said, you know what Abraham said? He said to him, son, I like that. He called him son. He didn't call him a wicked sinner. He called him a son. You know, Jesus is still moved with compassion every time he sees somebody in hell. You know why? Because it is not Jesus who sent them there. It is their personal choice which sent them to hell. As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy chapter 13, I believe it is verse 19, which says, I place before you life and death. And the Lord says, choose life. And if somebody voluntarily chooses death, they go to a, a place called hell, which is a place of torment and all the other things I've tried to explain. I'm sorry to say, words will fail us to even adequately describe the sufferings of hell. But my message is urgent. My message is important. Let's go on. Verse 26, And beside all this he said, Between us there is a great gulf fixed. In other words, once you cross to the other shore, there is no way we can come back. In other words, it's only a one-way ticket. Once you head to that particular direction, there is no way that we can ever come back. This should be a serious warning for us to align things in life so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot. Nobody will want to go to hell. But he's saying even if somebody wants to go, they cannot. Impossible nor can those from there pass to us. I'm, I'm here to tell you, this is a terrible place. I do not want to go there. Neither do I want any of us to go there. And that's why I preach this message to you. You see, in verse 27, there's an interesting twist and a turn. The man who lived sumptuously, as a matter of fact, this is a good side note, the man had no name. Ultimately, when somebody is in hell, he is so insignificant that he doesn't even need to have a name. But in heaven, yes, there is a name. Well, coming to the point at hand, verse 27, this man said, I beg you, therefore, Father. In the King James Version, it says, I pray thee, Father. In other words, right now as we speak, there's prayers happening in hell. You heard me right. There are praying and saying, please, if I can get out and give me one last chance, I will repent. I will make Jesus the Lord of your life. But the point is this, there's a gulf. You can never cross this gulf. Jesus made it very clear. He says, I beg you, therefore, Father, 
that you would send him to my father's house. Instantly, this man had a missionary burden. He had a burden for his brothers. He says, I have five brothers. But when it came to his lifestyle, he said to himself, let me enjoy myself. Nothing to do with the brothers, nothing to do with that beggar by the name of Lazarus just at his gate. But when he went to hell, he had a great missionary burden. He, he started to pray and he said, Abraham, send Lazarus to them that they may not come to this place of torment. Verse 29, Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Let them hear them. You see, I am preaching this message because I believe I'm included in that word them. I'm preaching this message as an answer to the rich man's prayer. The man prayed, oh God, send him that they will go to my brothers. Today, my friend, I am your brother in Christ. And I'm sharing this message out to you because there was a prayer which was made by a man who is in hell as we speak, crying out and saying, send this message to the, my brothers. And that is why I preach this message with all sincerity and urgency. He says, and in verse 30, and he said to them, no father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. What was he saying? If there's one person who can die, resurrect and go back, and speak the good news, they will repent. But I know somebody who died and rose again from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Bible says they beat him, they battered him and crucified him. He became the propitiation of our sins. He died for us in our place and they put him in that tomb. Lo and behold, the third day he rose victorious from the clutches of death and the grave. And as I mentioned to you, he says in the book of Revelation, I have the keys of Hades and death. Praise the Lord. That is the most important message the world needs to hear. The man said, if somebody raises from the dead and proclaims the message, there will be people who believe. But you know what Abraham said in verse 31? He says, but he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. In other words, even the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, there'll be people who will scoff at and mock at. But I'm here to tell you, what I'm sharing is going to become a very important message, especially when the church is raptured. The Bible will become the bestseller because they want to know what happens next. It is no more going to be a religious book so as to speak, but it's going to be a book of future information. The next steps to be taken, it's all in your Bible. And it also talks about how to make it to heaven at that point of time. And the message I am preaching today, it is going to be on media and people are going to log in and listen to what really happened. But you, my friend, don't have to wait for all that. Today, make Jesus the Lord of your life. Let the love of Christ compel you. The love of Christ is stronger than the fear of hell. Therefore, when I say this, I'm not come to scare you, but if that is going to help you in getting you to the Lord, it's okay. But my main motivation is right now, we are living in a time of grace of God. Enjoy this grace. F receive the free gift of salvation and you'll be in heaven. So my favorite band at that point of time, they sang Highway to Hell. But I pray that you'll sing, I am on the highway to heaven. I pray that will be your song, that will be your anthem, and that will be your motive. And I'm here to tell you, if we don't meet each other here, we will meet each other in heaven. May God richly bless you.